Hello and welcome to The Daily Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I am your host, Beth Johnson. And we are here to put science in your brain. Today we're going to be joined by Dr. Nick Castle to talk about Iceland's latest volcanic eruption. Posing no risk to property and air traffic, this eruption is bringing a bit of fire to an otherwise icy and snowy landscape. Before we bring on our guests, however, let's take a look at the news. Now, our news today starts us out on the planet Mars and quickly brings us home to a Mars simulation chamber on Earth. I'm doing this particular story because it involves things called Martian spiders that, while not actually spiders, are still able to twig Beth's arachnophobia. The rest of you, you have been warned. For many years, orbiting space probes have spied strange features on Mars that appear like sponge paintings to me, but are actually carved into the surface of Mars. It had been theorized that these features were caused by the sublimation of dry ice that had frozen in the soils over the Martian winter. Essentially, it gets so cold on Mars that like a scene from day after tomorrow, the air freezes solid. It just does it more slowly than in the movie, and it can end up in the Martian soil. Unlike water ice, melting dry ice goes straight from solid to gas, leaving behind a dry void where the ice used to be. While the theory that these patterns called Martian spiders are dry ice voids matches what we're seeing in theory, we haven't been able to visit with a rover any of these structures and actually verify our ideas. So scientists did the next best thing and recreated the formation of these features in a chamber pumped down to the same low temperatures and pressures of Mars. This work, published in Scientific Reports, was led by Lauren McCown, who states, The experiments show directly that the spider patterns we observe on Mars from orbit can be carved by the direct conversion of dry ice from solid to gas. It's exciting because we are beginning to understand more about how the surface of Mars is changing seasonally today. Mystery solved. Those spiders, which I really wished were called something else, are nothing more than a sign of changing seasons. I wish they'd called those Mars sponge patterns or something. I do not like spiders. Nope, not at all. Ugh. Here on Earth, we also have cases of gases coming out of the ground and uh, no spider-like shapes are involved. Beneath the surface of the earth, methane gas is intermixed with water, forming pockets of methane hydrate. Basically, the surface pressure is high enough that the gas is kept locked in between the water molecules. It's what we call thermogenic methane because it's produced directly by geological processes deep underground. This is opposed to the biogenic methane we all know from cows and some people. Thank you, Mary Roach. Anyway, Methane, of course, is a greenhouse gas, and that is a huge concern these days. The methane that is nicely locked underground can come bursting or seeping out if the pressure on that ground decreases. And the pressure can decrease for several reasons, one of which is the loss of Arctic ice sheets and their tremendous weight. It's definitely a negative feedback loop, and scientists are seeking to understand just how big a problem this could be in the near future. So a team took several sediment core samples off the coast of Svalbard in the Arctic Ocean to see how methane was released at the end of two periods of ice sheet loss. Methane is one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. So when it's released, carbonate-loving critters like foraminifera thrive and build shells with even more carbon-rich content than usual. And that carbon content can be tracked over time in the cores to see when the amount of methane changed. They found that as the ice melted, the pressure lessened and methane was released in both violent bursts and slow seeping. Once the ice melted, the release of methane stabilized, but just how much methane was released in each episode is unknown. 
since there are methane loving critters, the methane is consumed and the calculations are complicated. In fact, the team found that layers of massive bivalves, think clams and oysters in the cores, which confirms modern observations that these animals create massive communities around methane leaks. So while the methane release isn't good for us, it is great for some seafloor critters. This work is published in the journal Geology with lead author Pierre-Antoine de Sandier. As an astronomer, I'm used to seeing our universe as hydrogen, helium, and everything else that everything else I'm willing to refer to as metals. Today's news is challenging this way of seeing things and forcing me to consider the detailed chemistry behind all the different ices and rocks that make up our world and others. Here on Earth, as we'll be discussing more in the context of Iceland later in the show, here on Earth, we can learn about our world's history and internal structure from what we can find around volcanoes and coming out of their fissures and calderas. One of the most fascinating places to explore is the ocean floor. In new research in the Pacific Ocean, a team from Leeds Institute of Geophysics and Tectonics has obtained samples by sinking their drilling equipment six kilometers to the floor of the ocean and then drilling a further 1.5 kilometers. The site of their drilling was along the Pacific Ring of Fire, a region that has been geologically active for at least 50 million years. Their particular drill site was off the coast of Japan, and according to researcher Ivan Savov, this was one of the deepest waters ever to be considered for drilling, using a research vessel specifically designed for such challenging deep sea environments. When lava cools into a solid, that solid is called basalt. And Savav goes on to say, basalt is among the most common types of rocks on Earth. We are looking for basalt that was formed during the early Ring of Fire volcanic eruptions. And they found the basalts. And they found it, they found it was like nothing before seen with a unique chemical and mineral makeup that includes early erupt that indicates that early eruptions were both more powerful and more voluminous than previously thought. Savav adds, now that we know where and how this rock type is formed, we anticipate that many other rocks that we know were originally formed by ocean floor eruptions will be re-examined and potentially alter our wider understanding of the basalt formation. There are two places humans are only beginning to explore, the bottom of the ocean and outer space. Let's face it, planets like to hide their secrets, and our planet Earth is counted among that secretive crew. After the break, we'll be back with news from Titan, and later on, we'll be covering Iceland's latest eruption. Stay tuned. We don't talk about Titan all that much around here, but all that is going to change in the next few years. NASA has chosen the Dragonfly as the next new Frontiers mission, and this little rotorcraft is currently expected to launch in 2027, which seems like a long time from now and definitely feels like a long time since the end of the Cassini mission in 2017. I'm, I'm still sad about the end of Cassini, I won't lie but that mission is still the gift that keeps on giving. A team of scientists led by Rajani Dingra continues to analyze Cassini data with regards to Titan. And they've published a new paper in geophysical research letters that provides more evidence of rainfall on Titan. That's right, rainfall. You see, Titan may be a moon of Saturn, but it's also the most Earth-like body in the solar system that isn't actually Earth. It has a mostly nitrogen atmosphere. There are clouds seas, rivers, lakes, and even rain. Now, the lakes are made of hydrocarbons like methane and ethane instead of water, and the surface pressure is about 50% higher than Earth's, but still. Those lakes and seas might harbor life. It would be life that uses a different chemistry from most life on Earth, though. Hence, the continuing interest in Titan. And back in 2019, this same research group published a paper, also in geophysical research letters, that outlined the observational evidence for rainfall at the North Pole of Titan. 
Due to its axial tilt, Titan also has four seasons, which last about seven and a half years each. And these observations were conducted by Cassini during Titan's summer. Now, Cassini had already observed precipitation at the south pole of the moon, but surprisingly, not in the northern hemisphere where the majority of lakes and seas are located. So this team finds a bright ephemeral feature, that's what they called it, that appears to be the result of sunlight reflecting off a puddle, like sunlight would off of wet pavement here on Earth. The rainfall that caused this potential puddle should also have affected the temperature, but the event was so short-lived that Cassini's observations weren't precise enough to detect any change. The new study, however, details another bright ephemeral feature that came from the next pass of Cassini later the same year, and that detection was solid enough to resolve a temperature drop of 1.2 Kelvin around the BEF compared to the area surrounding it. By the next flyby, the BEF was gone. Dingra sums up the research. We were fortunate enough to have that number of spectra to see a perceptible temperature difference in a single flyby in a single day on Titan. So we have for the first time probably looked at the weather on Titan. We don't know the fate of the rainfall. Roger Clark, a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute who was not involved in the research, notes that a wet surface, ice, or even clouds can all cause the kind of spectral reflections that have been detected on Titan. So while this research seems solid, we won't know for certain until Dragonfly gets to Titan in 2035 and can make its own observations. As always, we'll keep you up to date with all the Dragonfly mission news and science as it happens. Next up, Dr. Pamela will talk about her favorite thing, volcanoes. In particular, Iceland is finally erupting, no one's life is being threatened, and she's excited. Plus, she'll interview Dr. Nick Castle about the topic. Stay tuned. Several weeks ago, we shared with you the news that increased tremors on the Reykjans Peninsula seemed to indicate magma was on the move and that a volcanic eruption was possible. Well, last Friday night, that eruption finally occurred. For the first time in 900 some odd years, the, I'm not going to say this correctly, Fagradjall Fall volcano began to erupt. This is a fissure volcano, which to my astronomer's eyes basically means it appears that the earth has cracked open, allowing magma from deep below to ooze and fountain out, building up a small cone and lava field. This volcano is considered safe with the exception of periodic clouds of poisonous gas, um, but it is neither expelling ash high into the air nor threatening homes or life with lava. The only real concern so far has been for possible archaeological sites. According to the Icelandic news site Moblis, archaeologist Adger Atsaksen raced to the site by helicopter after the eruption started, but didn't find any potential burial site, stating, I did not see the valley in its entirety before it went under the lava, so I do not dare to swear that nothing went under, but judging by aerial photographs, it is unlikely. For now, this volcano is calmly filling the valley it is located in, and if the eruption continues for tens of days, it may overfill it and spill into neighboring regions. Again, nothing is projected to get harmed. Vulcan volcanologists from the Iceland Met Office have already taken and processed samples of the lava emerging onto the surface, and it appears to have come directly from the Earth's mantle at a depth of 17 to 20 kilometers. This kind of a direct connection to below the Earth's crust is rare, and I look forward to more footage of volcanologists getting crazy close to the lava cooking sausages over the lava, yes, this is a thing they have been doing, and collecting more samples to, well, science upon their return to their labs. In just a moment, I will be joined by Nick Castle. Let's take a look at live footage from the volcano for now.
Joining me now is fellow PSI researcher, Dr. Nick Castle. Uh, Nick works with the Mars Ops team, but as a petrologist, which is something I'm going to have him explain in just a moment, um, he's pretty much interested in what goes on on any world that has a solid surface. Welcome, Nick. Tell us, tell us more about what you do. Okay, so I'm a petrologist with Mars Science Laboratory. I work with what's called the Chemistry Mineralogy or Chemin instrument which is an X-ray diffractometer. Uh, what that means is that we look at what are the minerals on the Martian surface. And looking at that compared to something like ChemCam uh, with its libs that can give you elemental compositions, is a little bit like looking at a recipe. They can tell you whether or not the recipe contains eggs, but we'll let you know if it's a sandwich or a cake. That is cool. Now, while you've been studying Mars, you kind of have checked out rocks from many different worlds. Can can you tell us just what makes Iceland such a special place for geologists and petrologists? Iceland's a fascinating field place for uh, anyone who studies igneous petrology. So let's break down that word for a second here. Petrology is the study of how rocks form. And igneous means we're talking about rocks that form from molten rocks, or in other words, lava or magma. The difference being whether it's above the surface or below. Uh, magma is something we have to calculate. Lava is something we can actually grab, which is why we care about the distinction. It's not about being pedantic about above or below the ground. Um, Iceland sits on a combination of a hot spot and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is where the uh, oceanic plate that is underneath the Atlantic Ocean splits apart and is making new ground all the time. Because it's a hot spot, we get to see this uh, mid-Atlantic ridge come all the way up to the surface of the ocean because of the extra vol uh, uh, volcanological activity related to the hotspot. That is amazing. And I'm going to have you explain more the difference between a hotspot and the mid-ocean ri ridge. But first, we're going to go to break. We will be right back and learn more about this amazing landscape. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, joining me now, we have Nick Castle, who is a petrologist who studies, well, the rocks and the stuff that makes them on worlds around our solar system. Now, you mentioned in the last segment that Iceland both sits on the Mid-Atlantic Divide, where the continental plates are pulling apart, and on a hot spot. What what does that all mean for this growing nation? Quite literally, actually. Um, so there's kind of three different settings on the Earth for where volcanoes are common. Uh, one of them is where plates are splitting apart. And so you get this breaking open. And those are what we call mid-ocean ridges, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge being one of the more famous ones. There are also hot spots, which are for one reason or another, heat is welling up from the mantle, possibly as far down from as far down as the core mantle boundary. Uh, and that creates volcanoes as well. Yellowstone being a very famous example of that. The third setting is what we call an island arc setting. And this is where two oceanic plates run into each other and one goes underneath and you get volcanoes on the overriding plate. So the Aleutian Islands would be a good example of that one. Uh, which is that island chain that connects Alaska to, uh, well, Russia. And and so it's the fact that we have both these things coming together in one place that allows this specific point to have this massive island, despite the lack of islands most of the way along the rest of the mid-ocean uh, rift. Yeah, it's unusual to get that uh, mid-ocean uh, mountain chain or rift uh, coming all the way up to the surface. In fact, to my knowledge, Iceland is pretty much a one good example of that. And what is kind of amazing about this island to me is the volcanoes have distinctive personalities that have gotten wrapped up into human mythology and lore. There's uh, one of my favorites is Katla, which hasn't gone off in a long time, but has been known to kind of 
ash over Scotland, which is a bit far away. Um, we saw a few years ago that back in 2010, there was an utterly unpronounceable volcano that disrupted air traffic. And since then, there's been other volcanoes that simply melted ice. What, what are the different factors that go into making all these volcanoes so very different? So there are a lot of different factors in how a volcano erupts. Uh, just like there's a lot of different personalities of people. I mean, some people are easily perturbed and um, you know, very easy to annoy. Some volcanoes are very explosive and blow up all the time. And the big controlling factors are what's the composition of the magma? Uh, that is, if it comes straight out of the mantle, it tends to be low in silica. And so it tends to be a very fluid sort of magma. Uh, we would say it has a low viscosity. And this makes it tend to be runny. On the other hand, if it has time to sit and dwell, it tends to drop out a lot of minerals that increase the silica content. It becomes much more viscous. It's like the difference between boiling a pot of water on your stove and boiling a pot of honey. I'd rather stand near the water because it's going to boil happily. The honey is going to pop, and I don't want to be anywhere near the hot sugar flying everywhere. The that. other thing is what we call magmatic volatiles. And this is how much, well, for lack of a better term, gas is going along with the magma. Now, this can be stuff that's coming out of the mantle too, uh, where you've got, for whatever reason, there's a lot of carbon dioxide or water or uh, hydrogen sulfide or a number of other things coming up along with it. Or even when it hits the surface, it can hit an ice cap. And if it hits an ice cap and your lava is sitting around 1,000 Celsius, well, that's 10 times as hot as it takes water to boil. So your glacier very suddenly became a steam bath. And that tends to make a nice explosive eruption as well. Now, with this one, there's been some confusion about what the essentially plumbing beneath it is. And now we're seeing today with the announcement that this is coming from 17 to 20 kilometers, a lot of excitement. Can, can you help put all these pieces together? Yeah, a, what we call a primary magma uh, is the holy grail for a petrologist. A primary magma is something that the mantle melted and then we saw it on the surface. Nothing else happened in between. And so if it's coming from 17 kilometers or deeper down, that's the mantle. That's definitely the mantle. And so if the melt happened there and came up over the course of even a year or so, that's really fast. So that's definitely a primary magma we're looking at. And that tells us a lot about the composition of the mantle underneath. You see, petrologists are always trying to figure out what's the middle of the planet looking like, you know, the stuff that we don't normally see on the surface. So when you get these direct samples, it's a free sample return from a place we can't go. That's why we get so excited. This, this is amazing. And I love the fact that because this is such a gentle eruption, we frequently see pictures of volcanologists just walking right up to the lava and grabbing a sample. And I can't wait to hear more about analysis of these samples. But as much as I could talk to you all day, our show must come to an end. Now, for those of you watching this on YouTube, uh, Nick will be hanging around to answer some questions and we'll, we will be releasing those questions uh, on YouTube. Unfortunately, if you're watching this on Now Media, commercials are coming. But for now, um, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to bring Beth back. This has been The Daily Space. Join us tomorrow when Annie Wilson covers all the latest rocket launches in our weekly Rocket Roundup episode. You can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the generous donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash cosmoquestx. Thank you all. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. And now we go to questions. Okay, let's see what all we have in here. So all hot spots are located on plate edges? Under log no, hot spots are not located on plate edges. Yeah, hot spots are located oh, wherever they're read. located. Yes, sorry, I misread what you typed. My bad. It's okay. I was answering questions in chat because...
I study this stuff too. So <laughs> Kerbal writes, I wish my room had that many windows referencing Nick's room. It is a glorious number of windows. It really is. <gasps> There's bits, bits, and we have dogs. I need to find the dog camera. So in case you weren't following the conversation in uh, in chat, then they'll ask what process formed the Canary Islands. And it's a hot spot, uh, not on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge like Iceland. That's actually, it's not completely unknown to have a hot spot and a ridge together. Like it happens, the Juan de Fuca Ridge where the axial seamount is, which I studied for mm. my master's, um, is both. <laughs> um, it's rare, but it happens. Uh, but most, most hot spots are just mid-plate, non-boundary effusions Something's of going on welling. with the mantle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it comes straight up from the mantle, basically. And what I was meaning with Iceland being unique is it's one of the few places where that actually all comes to the full surface. We get to see mm -hmm. the lab on the surface. So for reasons I don't know, my standard dog cam has said no. Um, I have another camera I can try and pull up. Manila has a direct connection. We're going to work on bringing you cute dogs. It's just going to take a moment. Sorry. CPI says if you want more windows, buy another computer. <laughs> but if you don't if you don't buy a PC, then you won't have more. Okay, anyway. I have all the screens, all of them. No one else needs she, screens. She she has all the screens and she loses her stuff. I do. It's a thing that happens. Yes. Sorry, I'm afraid I'm not actually looking at the chat. That's fine. So you have to tell me what the questions now. are. There, there aren't any questions. I answered the only question there was. <laughs> so, so what has you most excited about this uh, volcano? I just want to study it. But I've wanted to study Iceland volcanics for a long time. Um, Iceland, Iceland uh, is on my bucket list. <laughs> Sad. I've been there once. It was back in 2002 as an undergrad, and I've wanted to go back every ever since. Uh, I wish I had some Icelandic heritage because I'd just straight up move there. <laughs> I mean, I, I started learning Finnish this week because I didn't have any any Scandinavian languages in my pool, and and my mother told me that that I have failed. <laughs> so I grabbed Finnish. So that's uh, what you I'm, I'm learning. I know, I know, we're terrible. I will admit the very first thing I would do uh, if I got to go visit this volcano is stick a rock hammer in it and then keep that rock hammer covered in lava for forever. Okay, okay that, that I can understand. understand. Yeah. Yeah, just, just the rock hammer and that nice little drip bit of, of lava. Pull that yep. out, let it cool. It's actually really hard to get that home because it's, we don't think about it, but it's glass that you oh, just yeah. pulled out of that. It's rock glass too, so it's not even nice coherent glass. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, so we, we took samples of axial seamount and the, the eruption, the last eruption had happened, I think the year before. So it was fairly fresh, young uh, yep. basalt and glass and so much glass. And you had to be very That's careful so processing glass. your samples because it just breaks everywhere and gets, on everything. So processing like all of my tinier samples was like, okay, wash your hands afterward because that's going to end up in everything you touch is going to have oh, glass yeah. shards, little tiny, tiny glass shards. And if you see them under a microscope, they are pointy and awful. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get <laughs> dog bits, continue, continue discussing enthusiastic, enthusiastic volcano stuff. <laughs> Actually, one of the same problems with lunar dust. Um, because that's all made by impacts, none of it's worn down. And because impacts create uh, warm spots when they happen, it melts a lot of the, um, both the impactor and the ground that it hits. So you get these sharp shards of glass everywhere. Mm -hmm. And if you see pictures of the uh, Apollo astronauts caked in this dust, and you, then you think through, that's all broken glass. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I. It's it's like when I, I see those there's that one uh, Chris Isaac music video where they're on the the black sand beach in Hawaii and mm. it's just if you look beach, at it it's, it's, fun. it's it's shot in black and white and you can just see all of the the sand sticking to the to the model and to Chris Isaac and it's like 
uh uh-uh, uh uh-uh. that's just glassy sand no no that's not that's not well-rounded quartzy sand that's come from high in the mountains and traveled a long ways and is all nice and round and circular and doesn't hurt you that's pointy sharp stuff Pass. actually the best <laughs> beach i know of uh, on the big island is a green sand beach uh, and it's where there is an old little cinder cone uh, that had been popping out a ton of uh, pyroxene and uh, olivine uh, little mineral grains and the glass that was surrounding it uh, very easily weathered away. And so this beach is just feeding off of you know, what weathers out of the cinder cone and it's nothing but these mineral grains. It is phenomenal. When it's wet with the ocean, it looks kind of a, a greeny brown, but if you let it dry out a little bit, it turns this brilliant shade of green. And it's wonderful. Definite oh, rock I do. nerd. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the the olivine sand. That's the stuff that they're trying to use to trap carbon, isn't it? They're talking about figuring out how to use the olivine right. sand as a carbon trap. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a chemical reaction that happens there uh, where you can make uh, carbonates out of silicate weathering, and olivine happens to be one of the ones that's more chemically susceptible to that. I hadn't thought about that. Cool. Enthusiasts, nerds, sponge of useless information. <laughs> um, so, so thank, thank you, you again, again Fen Mill, for the bits. bits. I hope you enjoyed the cute doggos. You apparently have some echo, Pamela. Is your uh, is the mic on oh. on your dog cam? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the joys of too much technology. All right, that should be fixed. Sorry about that, everyone. Oh, fifth dimension has been up Hecla. That is cool. Hecla is one of the um, more famous, I guess. Mm-hmm. Nope. You want to come here? You want to say hi? Actually, one of the coolest types I did um, way oh. back in Iceland. Um, I don't even remember where in Iceland it was, but there's a local farmer that was showing us a hike uh, up near his farm. And one of the places, there's this little natural grotto uh, uh-huh. of columnar basalt. And so it looked like these black basalt pillars coming down around this frozen waterfall because they were there, you know, over spring break, aka middle of winter. Oh, wow. Um, and we we're walking on the stream because it was frozen solid. And there's just this spike of ice that goes up around this grotto of bas- columnar basalt is straight up magical it was beautiful that's super cool so so Kerbal is learned... asking oh sorry uh mm-hmm. Kerbal is asking is the stuff on the moon volcanic in origin it depends yes, what you mean some of it yeah so i mean yeah it the mare basalts tend to be like they're they're flood basalts so yeah. yes they would be volcanic but since the moon doesn't are... have <laughs> there are actual volcanoes. <laughs> One thing they could test. Since the moon doesn't have actual volcanoes or plate tectonics, it, it's uh, actually so, the moon did have volcanoes uh, and yeah, quite it a did. few of them. It just doesn't They're now. Just, yeah, yeah, it doesn't now. Yeah. Um, okay, what we were here. talking about uh, with the lunar dust was actually mostly impact glass, and a lot of that hit on things that you would call ran- volcanic terrains. And there's some debate over whether you should consider things like the anorthosite you know, as volcanic because it was igneous, probably a flotation crust uh, on, you know, when the moon was all molten, one of the minerals that forms has a lower density and that's plagioclase. And that's what makes the lunar highlands uh, because as a lower density than the melt, it would float and it would be like an iceberg sitting on top of the ocean, um, except it's, you know, magma. So is that volcanic? Does, uh, probably not actually, but, yeah, I'm going to have a hard time defining terms. So I'm just going to call it igneous and be done. So, so uh, Zena is asking, uh, has the, the lava, does lava have a unique fingerprint of minerals from each volcano? Uh, unique is probably uh, pushing a little too far. Um, different volcanoes can have different fingerprints uh, based off of Uh, what's going on underneath that volcano. Where's the magma ultimately coming from? How complicated is the plumbing between where it came from and the surface? How long did it linger there? 
uh, what else was going on. But it's also not like every volcano erupts only one composition. In fact, most of the time, a volcano will have a progression of compositions. So there are eruptions on Hawaii that lasted something like 35 years. But the first little bit that comes out is what we call an alkalic basalt. So this has a lot of sodium potassium, uh, among other things, in it. And then it switches to the main mode of Hawaiian eruptions, which is tholeitic. And then that'll usually go dormant for a while and then erupt one last time with another alkalic basalt. And so these are very different mineral and elemental compositions that are coming out of the same rift. Now, with the Iceland, Icelandic volcanoes, when this one first started going off, there was some confusion because in various... Uh, air radar software, they identify the volcanoes not by the particular peaks, but by which uh, set of plumbing they're attached to. And this one was misidentified with a um, different set of plumbing. And it turned out the plumbing for this one actually isn't well known and the software just basically was misdirected. What, what do we have to learn and what can you tell us about the various plumbing in this system? So on this system specifically, uh, I don't know enough to comment on air because okay. I will almost certainly have to retract whatever I say. Fair. Um, in terms of in general, uh, with volcanic plumbing, we're trying to figure out, so we have these historic flows, but we want to place them in context for what happens to get to this thing we see. We have a pretty good idea of the mantle. We have a pretty good idea of the geologic setting that is the uh, tectonic setting for this. And we know the samples on the surface, but there are missing pieces in that puzzle. And if we can connect the different plumbings together, we can start to say, oh, these pieces belong together. Maybe this makes an edge in a corner over here to solve the puzzle that is, what are Iceland volcanics? Yeah. Uh, and so connecting the plumbing systems together gives us more information about you know, which parts belong together that I, I know there's some cool things that they've seen in the past where, um, for instance, uh, Katla typically goes off shortly after the unpronounceable volcano that went off in 2010. And it's believed that this is due to some sort of a dike relationship that they haven't been able to figure out yet. And I, for one, am still waiting for Katla to go. <sighs> but, um, Trying to figure this out is trickstery. I the the volcanoes essentially change the plumbing every time they erupt. Yep, uh, and that's just because. So, you stick a bunch of cold lava, or you stick a bunch of lava someplace that isn't erupting out magma. I guess I should call it. It cools and crystallizes. That makes new solids. The solids are part of the new plumbing. Yeah. So what's left? It would be kind of like if uh, Old Faithful at Yellowstone, that one seems to have some very consistent plumbing, which has let it have the same periodicity of eruptions, uh, geysers, uh, yes. for a very long time. If one time it erupts just a little too hard and breaks part of that plumbing, it will change character. It will have a different timing and maybe not even a consistent one anymore. This is actually one of the reasons why they've started telling people, you know, you throw trash in a geyser, we throw you out of the park with a fine. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in fact, there was uh, near Grand Prismatic, I don't remember the name of it, there was another geyser that was relatively predictable. And then one day it went off and blew out the hillside. And now there's this ripped out hillside where there's a whole bunch of um, uh, hot spring pools, uh, but no geyser because it blew itself out. So Zion is asking, are there old slabs of sunken crust below the mantle? How best should That's we think about that? That's a great question. Um, I not... will admit, I haven't read the literature on that for a while, um, but it's been a hot topic of debate for at least the last 20 years. No pun intended. <laughs> Sorry, what did I say? A hot, hot topic, topic of debate. Okay, I, I don't even mean to make puns anymore. This is terrible. <laughs> um, so we've gotten better and better and better at getting seism 
uh, seismic pictures of the inside of the Earth. Uh, but the contrast gets really low the further down you get because a lot of the um, what we call acoustic impedance, that is um, how different one thing is from another when you look at a seismic wave, um, is a function of temperature. So as the slab heats up, uh, it starts to look more and more like the mantle surrounding it. And so it's harder and harder to tease it out. But for a while now, we've actually thought we've had pictures of a slab going the whole way down uh, to the core mantle boundary. Is this right? I don't know. Um, drill me a hole and show me. Yeah, don't so they've actually drill some, me a hole. <laughs> they they found some. Uh, they've done some seismic research into like the Farallon plate, which is um, uh, off the coast of California. It would have been, and now it's it's underneath the North Atlant the North American plate. And they've actually found some evidence that that they can actually see the edge of that, and that it's you know delaminating down into the mantle and, and fading away. So it's, and I think they're also finding one that's underneath uh, Michigan. If I remember there was some evidence for one up north too, where they've actually done some seismic data and, and found that there's another plate that's disappearing there too. Cool. That's one of those ones that I'm, know I'm fascinated by. <laughs> I, my emphasis is on rocks. My seismology is somewhat weak. Um, I, I love it, but uh, please don't ask me to actually interpret a spectrogram. Um, do they know the uh, piece that's under Michigan, whether it came from uh, the East Coast subduction zone uh, in one of the Appalachian events, or if it's um, a extremely uh, deep piece off of the West Coast? Uh, I think it's from the the East Coast, okay. if I remember that rightly. That makes sense. Um, um, Having done my undergrad on the East Coast, uh, the Appalachian uh, orogenic events were uh, oh, near and wait, dear to no, my heart. Hold on. Okay, I found the I found the paper. <laughs> I found the press release at least. <laughs> uh, Oceanic plateau. Oh, okay. Sorry, it it was researchers from Michigan State. That's why I'm my alma mater. That's why Michigan was uh, in my head. Uh, da, 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 it's. Oceanic Plateau has been observed for the first time in Earth's lower mantle, 800 kilometers deep underneath eastern Siberia, pushing Hawaii's birthplace back to 100 million years. Wow. Yeah. So that's tracing along the Emperor Seamount chain uh, and mm -hmm. uh, the Kamchatka Peninsula. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's really cool. That, by the way, is a really fascinating place where you've got two island arcs that meet at a corner. Like, okay, what happens in the subduction there? Because you can't just take the plate and fold it like you would need to to do that corner. So is it a slab tear? Uh, is it magic happens when you go under the earth? Like, what's going on? The geometry doesn't work out. Yeah, what I yeah, love that, is that, you, that you curved can... surface problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can't easily model this one with Oreo cookies, which is how a lot of tectonics cool. can get taught. Yes, an awful lot of it. I mean, we do, in my class, we do like a flat world. And that's the problem is like, you, mm -hmm. you have basically like three plates and it's like, here's one going this way and here's one going this way. And then there's like the ridge down the middle and you can't really model too much. <laughs> Cause it's like, this is really basic. <laughs> so it was actually, sorry. Go ahead and answer. It's fine. I was going to say it was a great headcanon for me the first time someone pointed out, you know, you can actually model plate motion not as this object moving that direction, but as it is rotating around this pole. It's like, oh, cool. curved surfaces are weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the question uh, has been raised by Larry Weird. Has Nick ever smelled a volcano? I have. Uh, in one? fact, I've smelled several volcanoes. Um, so I've been to Iceland. So I've smelled not an active volcano there, but I've smelled volcanoes in that area. Uh, I've been to the big island of Hawaii and smelled an active volcano there. I've been to Yellowstone several times. So depending upon what you want to talk about for volcano, I've smelled that too. Um, I've been to Mount St. Helens and definitely smelled that one. Wow. Um, so... 
I can't remember if I actually licked Devil's Tower or not. That's technically a volcano. I'm not going to smell it the same way. Do not lick the science. Hey, I'm fine. a geologist. Rocks are fine as long as, as long as they're not made of lead. Rocks are fine. As long as you know what you're doing, you're allowed to lick rocks. Because <laughs> if you lick the rocks made out of mercury, lead, or uranium, you might be in some trouble. Yeah. All right. All right. On that note, we are running up on the end of the hour, and I'm being reminded also do not lick the cinnabar. Yeah, that, that would, would be mercury, mercury sulfide. <laughs> okay. I again hydrogen and helium, everything else. And if, oh, you, no. if you want to know more about cinnabar and mercury, you can ask me. I actually did a poster on it. Um, so I'm doing a final scan through, and I think we've gotten hi. all the questions. You want to um, say hi? Today's cat sighting oh. was number 42 on our list of cat <laughs> sightings. No, but here have a different cat. Oh, so now we have 43. Hello. Someone type the command. I can type type the command actually. An auspicious day to make it to number 42. Hi. There we go. Oh. <laughs> All right. So tomorrow uh, I will be behind the scenes producing Annie. Uh, Beth will be having a much deserved day off. What are you up to now? Uh, what's what's in your future, Nick? That's a good question. Uh, I've got a paper I need to revise. I've got two grant proposals I need to get off the ground running and a couple more I need to convince other people to get off the ground running. You know, the life of a scientist. Write more things. That I'm, I'm sounds awesome. I'm supposed to go get my first chow chi ouchie today. Ooh, congratulations. Enjoy the stabby excited. stabby. <laughs> All right, so... I think that's it for today. Um, does anyone have any preferences on who we should raid? Um, as always, you can use your channel points to dictate the raid. We are here. And there are still points being collected toward a community <coughs> game night. Uh, let's see. So oh, the God, question no. arises, does chocolate count as a mineral? I'm pretty sure that that's an organic. Yeah, chocolate's yeah. organic. It is, it is, uh, yeah. It, it is no, a naturally it occurring count, uh, inorganic uh, material with a definite crystalline structure uh, and chemical composition. So chocolate fails because it's not inorganic. Okay. And it's not really crystalline either, so. Uh, it is really crystalline. It's just not really naturally occurring. Um, you can get a, in fact, there's something like seven different crystal structures for chocolate. So you can get a definite uh, crystallography out of it. Ice is a mineral. I will die on that hill. Ice is definitely a mineral. So we uh, can't do Professor Milko. Um, does anyone have any, any preferences beyond Prof Milko? Uh, I guess Rams Reef. He's, yeah. Okay. I don't see anybody else really. Well, oh, bother's up. Oh, I, not coming up in my list. So okay. I'm gonna go ahead and try. Oh, bother. So and side note, Beth. Okay. If you ever want to really irritate a uh, glaciologist, tell them that they study uh, monomineralic aggregates, not rocks. On that note, oh, that'll be fun. <laughs> Wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Take care of yourselves and each other. We'll get through this. We'll see you on the other side. <laughs> bye, bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs>